Hello everyone, uh, this is Omar and today we will talk about how to fail fast and retry soon. It's a technique that you might be familiar with but we will drill into the details, see the benefits, downsides and challenges in distributed systems. I'm a software engineer at Square. I was born in Egypt, lived and had a job in India, Turkey and currently in Canada. In Canada I lived in Vancouver on the west side, Toronto on the east side. Other jobs I like to do, uh, I like to do teaching, farming, gardening, and woodwork, and surprisingly, babysitting. I have a blog where I discuss different topics related to software engineering, like software engineering processes, algorithms, data structures, distributed systems, and software engineering teams. In distributed systems, services consist of a fleet of nodes that function as one unit. It's not uncommon for some nodes to go down, usually for a short time. When this occurs, failures can happen on the client side and can lead to wide-ranging problems. To build resilient systems and reduce the probability of failure and increase the application performance, we're going to talk about timeouts and the downsides of not having a timeout and what timeout to set. Next, retries. When should we retry the failed request and the pitfalls of retries? After that, we will see how Backoff and Jetter can improve resource utilization and reduce congestion. And finally, we are going to see an adaptive mechanism to dynamically adjust the request rates in response to higher error rates and unsuccessful retry attempts. Timeouts Timeout is the maximum amount of time that a client must wait for something to happen, for example, a request to complete. So rather than waiting indefinitely, we stop waiting after the timeout period has elapsed. And why should we use timeout? Well, because no or long timeouts eat resources. When a client is waiting for a request to complete, it holds on to the limited resources like memory, threads, connections, while waiting for the response. And this might be okay for a few requests, but when the number of requests taking longer than usual increase, the service can run out of these resources, causing the server to crash. And as a best of practice, we should set time out, not only on the remote calls, but also between internal calls across processes on the same machine. A common question is, what time out to set? If too high, it won't be useful, almost like no time out. And if too low, we might terminate the request early, so increase the error rate. One approach is to look at the latency percentile, the P99, for the downstream service and use that as a starting point for our client's timeout. This is obviously not a one-size-fits-all solution. For example, the P99 might fluctuate and might not be consistent, and in this case, we may choose to set timeout to the worst case, the best case, or the average P99. Another case where the P99 or the maximum latency is much higher than the P95 or the P99 due to some outliers. We do not want to have a timeout that's too high, so we do not want to consider the worst so we want to consider the worst case latency, but we do not want to account for these outliers. So we fill the request fast and retry as we will see next, hoping that it won't take long this time. And if we have a high client network latency, client timeout should be padded with a reasonable worst case network latency. We can use this diagram on the right hand side as an example. The P99 is less than one second, the maximum latency is higher and it fluctuates, and in this case, a timeout of one second makes sense since all requests taking longer than one second seem to be outliers. Now, regardless of the timeout value, the goal here is to reduce the percentage of false timeouts. And if we notice that many requests are timing out, then timeout needs to be higher. But we should first ask, why the request is timing out? Maybe it's not because the client timeout is short or the downstream service is taking longer. Maybe the code is establishing a new connection on each request, taking longer to send a request. Now, timeouts might reduce long hanging requests and therefore reduce consumption of limited resources and overall latency, but timeouts do not reduce error rates. 
retries. So retrying the same request as a result of failure, timeout, or any non-deterministic error often succeed. And this is because behind the scene, fault tolerant systems usually consist of a fleet of nodes and do not fail as a single unit. Instead, partial or transient failures are more common. So retrying the request allow clients to survive these random partial and transient failures. Here are some facts about retrying. First, retries are less useful and pointless in case of deterministic errors where retrying the request will almost always fail. Trying to withdraw money from a bank account with insufficient funds is a good example. In eventual consistency systems, however, a client error if retried later might succeed as the system state propagates. Retrying is only safe if an operation is idempotent, and that's because a timeout or failure does not necessarily mean that an operation hasn't been executed. This is a real production use case where the database maximum latency went down from 10 seconds to 500 milliseconds after employing timeouts and retries. This also increased the success rate as a result of retrying failed requests due to timeout or server internal errors. Now, when partial and transient failures are rare and the overall number of retry requests is small, timeout and retries can improve availability, reduce latency, and increase the success rate. But these are the same things that retries can put at risk if not used wisely. So we will talk a little bit about the risks that retries can introduce First, retries consume resources. So they trade off server-limited resources like memory, CPU, connections for higher success rates. And this might block other running operations waiting to be executed. And because of that, in almost all cases, we should limit the number of client retries. Next, retries increase load on the downstream service. And if failures are due to service being overloaded, Retrying can delay recovery by keeping the downstream service under high load for long. Let's take a few examples on this. First, hot partition. Retrying failures might not work as we're still overwhelming the hot partition. Next, multiple service layer. Now I'm sure most of you have been through this where it started with retrying a minor error and ended up turning the whole system down. Imagine a database that decided to non-deterministically or error on certain SQL statement, and clients the front end are retrying the request and maybe the back end too. This will obviously increase the load on the database, but even worse, it gets amplified when the back end consists of multiple layers of microservices. In this diagram below, our client is sending requests to service A, and then to B, and then C, and then to the database. Now imagine if each layer is retrying independently well, the database will just explode. One approach is to have the retry logic on the exit service, the service that talks to the database directly, because these microservices were essentially one service, but we broke them down. And finally, rate limiting. Services such as AWS S3 and Cloudflare have rate limits, so excessive requests will be throttled and too many retries is not so different from a service attack. Now, throughout the rest of this session, we will see different solutions to mitigate the risks of free tries. Back off. A solution to retries in succession on a service failing because it's overloaded. So instead of retrying immediately and aggressively, the client waits for some period between retries. And what's the benefits? Well, retrying immediately when the downstream service is overloaded and the likely outcome is another failure with resources. Back off also gives the downstream service some breathing time to heal when already overloaded, so it's not flooded with retries. And how long should we wait? Well, the most common algorithm is the exponential back off, where the wait time increases exponentially after every retry. Now this diagram shows the difference between retrying immediately and retrying with a back off. 
With our back off, we do not see gaps between subsequent retries. But with the back off, you can see the gaps between retries and it grows exponentially after every retry. Now it's important to remember that back off just delays the retries. So a service under a constant overload or in case of contention, back off is insufficient. This is because failed request when back off to the same time because contention or overload again when they are retried. Jitter. Jitter add randomness to the back off when retrying a request to spread out the load and reduce contention. And what jitter to use? Well, there are different approaches. The first and the most common one is to add randomness to the back off value. So this is calculated by taking the exponential back off and adding or subtracting from it a random value, for example, from 50 to 150 millisecond, or we can multiply the exponential back off with a random number from a randomization interval, which can be, for example, from 0.5 to 1.5. An alternative approach is to choose a random slave duration between zero and the back off value. Now, comparing these two approaches, when you look at the resource utilization, they both use less resources because work is spread out due to randomization. With the time to complete, the first one takes longer because of longer sleeps, and the second approach takes less, less time to complete because the sleep duration minimum range is zero, so from zero to the back off. Use the first approach when we need to back off retries to give downstream service time to heal. For example, when we exceed the service rate limit. And for the second approach, because the retry may happen immediately, retrying failures due to exceeding rate limit or overload will almost always fail. So only use this approach if most failures are due to contention and spreading out retries is just what we need. Another diagram here that shows the difference between retrying with back off and retrying with back off and jitter. So with randomness, you can see that retries are randomized and do not happen at the same time. Now, Jitter is not only for retries. It can help spreading out spikes of work by periodic jobs or any repeated work scheduled at regular intervals. For example, expiring cache keys around the same time will increase the load on the cache to remove expired keys, maybe later to repopulate the cache, it will also increase the load on the database as a result of cache mess and might reduce the system latency and availability. Now to put everything together, here's an example of code in Golang that shows how to implement timeouts, retries, back off, and jitter. So in a loop, we first check if we exceeded the maximum retries. Next, we execute the operation with a timeout. It could be sending a remote request or querying the database and then we wait for a response. The operation could fail due to any kind of error, and if the error is permanent, like in case of client errors, then it's pointless to retry. Otherwise, we sleep for some time and then retry the operation again. We calculate the back off by multiplying the exponential function with a constant delay duration, for example, 100 millisecond. Next, we multiply the back off with a randomization interval where the interval is between 0.5 and 1.5. So for example, if the back off is 100 millisecond, the sleep duration is any number in the range of 50 millisecond to 150 millisecond. Now, you might be wondering, now that we have seen all these techniques, are we done yet? The answer is no. Adapter retries. When a large percentage of requests are failing and retries are unsuccessful, like in case of longer running issues, the techniques that we talked about are not sufficient anymore. And this indicates that future retries are not currently welcome and, and that we need to throttle any unwelcome requests until some time period. And how to do that? We will use the token bucket algorithm and this algorithm is widely used in rate limiting to determine when it's safe to transmit data that complies with the limits. We will also compare the token bucket algorithm with a circuit breaker. Well, how does the token bucket algorithm work? So the standard algorithm works by having a bucket 
holding token that clients maintains in memory. It's just a counter and integer. And periodically, a fixed number of token is added into the bucket by increasing that counter, that integer. So when a client wants to make a request, it attempts to remove tokens from the bucket. And if there are sufficient tokens, the client removes them and completes the request. And if there aren't, it throttles the request and either drops it or waits until there are enough tokens to make the request. So the goal here is to rate limit the total number of requests to downstream service. When the error rate is high, we try to drain the, the bucket and, and therefore throttle any future requests until the bucket slowly begins to refill. Now a variation of this standard algorithm is instead of adding tokens with a fixed amount periodically, we add tokens on successful attempts. So client can make initial request regardless of the token availability. If it succeeds, it adds parts of that token in the token bucket, for example, 0.1 token. And if the call fails, retry up to end time as long as there are tokens in the bucket. Well, this means if the error rate is above threshold, and in this case it's 10%, only one retry is allowed for each 10 successful requests. So the goal here is to rate limit retries when the error rate is above threshold by throttling retries that exceed that threshold. And in this case, the maximum number of retries is only 10% of the successful attempts. Now let's talk about circuit breaker. Circuit breaker is another approach to stop all retries when the error rate is above threshold, saving resources and providing immediate feedback to the client but it suffers from modality. It's either retrying or not retrying, and therefore can introduce additional time to recovery. Here's a diagram that demonstrates the difference between the circuit breaker, the token bucket, and then the retries algorithms we saw earlier. We consider error rate around 10% to be high. First thing we notice is that all algorithms are the same when error rate is low. Once it approaches 10%, the circuit breaker starts to stop all future retries, so it deviates from the rest. The token bucket does not seem to deplete its bucket fast enough, so it's getting better, better success rate at a cost of additional load. Then retries is retrying without throttling, so it has the highest success rate, but it also has the highest load. But keep in mind that requests are coming from different clients, and not all clients see the same failure rate. So to summarize, circuit breaker has no additional load at high failure rates, but lower success rate at the threshold. Token bucket has some tunable additional load at higher failure rates, but and has higher success rate. And both of them behave like n retries under low error rate. So to recap real quick, timeouts avoid client requests from hanging long by holding onto limited resources. Retries can survive partial and transient failures and therefore increase the success rate. Backoff and jitter can improve resource utilization and reduce congestion. And finally, the adaptive retry dynamically adjusts the request rate in response to a higher error rate and unsuccessful retries. These techniques, when applied properly, the return is huge, but when applied blindly, they can cause a wide-ranging problem, including a complete outage. Now, I'm sure most of you might know about these topics that we talked about today, but I wanted to show you what seemed to be an easy problem turned out to be quite hard in distributed system, and really depends on the nature of the system. And getting the happy path working is the easy part, but going beyond that is when the real engineering work begins. Thank you so much.